session in just a couple of minutes. So next up is Eve Mahler, the CTO of uh, Forge Rock. Um, she's going to be talking about consent. Wonderful. Thanks. Am I sharing my screen correctly? Uh, you are. Yes. Yay. I love when a thing comes together. Awesome. Well, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm excited to be back at API Days, in this case, Interface, uh, in this case, virtually. Um, I'm a CTO of Forge Rock. Uh, we help people safely and simply access the connected world. Um, it's a complex time in privacy. Uh, you know, with COVID-19, uh, we have people pulling back on implementing regulations, but we have people caring more about privacy with things like contact tracing. Um, so I thought I'd talk about uh, the nature of consent, uh, the nature of where it's going. We just heard from Matt about some ways to maybe implement it. Um, and I want to talk about uh, how we need to perhaps get beyond consent. Um, uh, what do I mean by democratizing data control? Um, this talk is about some research that I did uh, with Lisa Lavasher, with whom I do some standards, and uh, research that we published in an IEEE journal called, um, 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 uh, sorry, um, what is it called? Communication Standards, <laughs> in fact. Um, so if we take a look at the data protection and privacy legislation map worldwide, I've been tracking it. Um, uh, over the course of this year, um, and before we kind of knew what was going to happen with certain pandemics, um, we had 58 countries with uh, actual legislation already passed, 10% of countries with draft legislation, 21 countries with no legislation at all, and things have actually progressed even with kind of the slowdown, the COVID-19 slowdown. Um, and consent is actually a big principle uh, in all of this privacy legislation. Uh, and, and there's kind of a difference in, in the nature of, of consent when you look at, say, in the EU, uh, you see that there's, the, there's human rights basis to consent. In the U.S., it's a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's got a kind of a property principle, a property rights principle. And you see a difference between opt-in versus opt-out and how it's supposed to work. Nonetheless, consent is really, really important. We're supposed to do it. Uh, and then... As a companion uh, to what's going on in the world, we have the kind of financial services world. We have the global, global open banking uh, phenomenon uh, starting in the UK, open banking, uh, big O, big B, uh, and then spreading out from there all over the world. I think this map is probably even out of date now. Um, the open banking phenomenon has kind of three features. It has uh, secure customer authentication, so secure authentication. Um, so that's a, uh, a security feature. It has data portability, and it has consent. Um, so re uh, relevant to COVID-19, uh, you might want to know that in just the first month of the coronavirus lockdown, 6 million UK adults, that's 12% of the UK population, actually downloaded their bank's mobile app for the first time, and they may care about things like secure customer authentication and data portability and consent. Um, so a little bit more in a moment about open banking. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what consent means, what it means legally, and how well it's working. So about a little over a year ago, a legal scholar named Nancy Kim came out with a book called Consentability. I guess maybe a word she made up, consent and its limits. And she defined kind of uh, across the globe the three pillars of what you need legally for consent. And, and you won't be surprised that it needs manifestation, meaning kind of an act, a positive act to say that you, you consented. Uh, it needs knowledge. You need to know what you're consenting to. Uh, and it needs what, what lawyers will call voluntariness. So that, that means basically volition. You need to uh, kind of have a free, free will uh, in what you're doing. Now, there's context involved in how strongly you need to uh, uh, no, do all these things in, in terms of consenting to whether it's, uh, I don't know, uh, an act of surgery to, I don't know, you need, you need an arm removed or something like that versus uh, consenting online to, to share some personal data. But nonetheless, we're, we're pretty aware of these kind of things. So, so my co-author and I looked at some typical patterns online of, of broader permissions to share personal data in a digital context. Um, so we found that there were six typical patterns. Um, 
First of all, we found that there are four patterns of really classical consent, cookie consent, permissions within an application to share consent, uh, share personal data, marketing preferences, and then third-party permissions. Now, cookie consent, obviously, we're all very aware of it. It's the first time we typically meet a website that we run into cookie consent. Um, and then third-party permissions are really important because that's kind of the OAuth pattern of how we do app connections. Um, so these are quite often opt-in, but most particularly, this is kind of a pull pattern, right? So we have a consent seeker and they want consent from a consenter. The fifth pattern that we saw was the terms of service agreement. I chose Stan Lee as my representation of a signature. So this is something that we, we run across when we maybe create an account or maybe the terms of service have changed, so we're asked to re-agree. Um, we see it with privacy policies as well. And this is meant to be kind of even Steven, you know, where there's an offer made and we're asked to accept it. And so it's meant to be kind of we're on an even footing. And then there's kind of a sixth weird and powerful pattern of permissions. And this is party to party sharing or delegation. And this is the share button. This is when, say, in Google Docs or um, in Dropbox or in TripIt or something like that, which I remember when we used to travel, um, you want to share some access to, say, a Google Docs document, but you choose not to give edit access, you choose to give just view access, something like that. And so this is really quite different. It's a push pattern. You're choosing with nobody potentially asking you how much to share, what to share, maybe when you want to take back the sharing. So these were the six patterns that we observed. Now, let's have some real talk here. Um, how well is most of these permissions really working? Um, lawyers actually call most of the consent out there defective, and we would call it broken. <laughs> Plainly and simply, uh, the acts or manifestations of consent, the knowledge, the voluntariness or volition. Uh, we have apps spying on us. We have the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. We have abusive marketing preferences stuff. We have stuff sent to us we didn't agree to. Um, there was some great uh, research about the biggest lie on the internet um, where uh, there was a fake social network they put together um, and there was a terms of service agreement that should take 15 minutes to read um, and people were taking 51 seconds maybe on average to read it. Um, totally missing the gotcha clauses in there about how I agree to share my data with the NSA and I agree to pay for the app with my firstborn children. So it's clearly not working. And, and this is in a context, okay, that research wasn't done uh, really before uh, in, ter in terms of uh, GDPR enforcement, but we've now had two years of GDPR enforcement. We've now had a good year of um, CCPA in the California um, privacy context. Um, and what's happening is, um, GDPR has, 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 you know, been with us. CCPA has been with us. CCPA is already trying to be fixed. They've got something on the ballot to try and fix CCPA and make it stronger. So um, what we see is out and out abuse. We've got a failure mode. We've got folks who are trying to not ask for consent. They're just doing the minimum. So this is an example of a dark pattern. So if you, if you follow dark patterns on Twitter and they've got a website, you'll see examples like this. So this is cookie consent here. If you take a quick look, what you're seeing is you can check any checkboxes you want or not check any cookie checkboxes you want. But at the bottom of the screen, if you do the obvious thing, what you're doing is select all cookies and confirm. And you have to notice that at the right, there's that confirm selection, which is the one that you actually really want. So you can figure out, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, whether this is legal or not. But what it is is it's not really a consent seeker and a consenter, and it's not consent, it's, it's deception. They're, they're a Decepticon, right? They just are. So what do we have to do to actually get to a non-dysfunctional relationship, a, a functional relationship? Um, we need to get to some kind of mutual agency and value exchange, let's call it. So, so Lisa Lavasher, my, my uh, co-author and co-researcher, um, run something called the Need to the Alliance, in fact, and, and we're looking for something that can be mutual, can start with um, the notion of a, a me to be relationship. And so what we developed was a set of criteria that you'd actually need to meet, because clearly 
the notion of consent is just it's not even working. So we developed these four criteria. An individual has to be able to assert the terms that they're interested in for sharing digital, their, their, their personal data. Um, they have to be able to specify those terms proactively prior to supplying any personal data, including any authentication data used in account setup if there is an account. So identity is just a tool that we use to develop digital relationships, really. Um, third, they have to have a choice about being remembered. That's, that's, that's what the identity tool is being used for. They have to be able to go to a site, for example, without any tracking at all. That's got to be their choice. And fourth, I mean, just the same way the terms of service agreements are, they're, they're part of an agreement, the terms have to be usable for the person and for the organization. Okay. Plain and simple, you hope. So the idea is that we need to be thinking about life cycles of relationships, not just in terms of identity management, which has life cycles, but also in terms of relationship management with people involved as well. So this cataloging of permission types enabled us to do actually a legal analysis with some lawyers that we worked with. And we realized that the properties of consent with the consenter and the consent seeker, well, it sort of came up, no bueno. It didn't meet our criteria. Um, the contract relationship with the offerer on the organization side, the acceptor, did not work very well either. But there is a special kind of contract called the license, which if an, or if an individual is able to offer it to the organization in some fashion, it, a license kind of a special kind of contract, but it's really its own beast. And it could potentially meet the criteria if we could find some technology that could help us do that. And we actually found two technologies, at least, that could start to do that. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, the first is UK open banking, potentially, as a solution. So um, you don't have to really stare at the... Um, uh, these acronyms here at the top, but I've, I've expanded them. UK Open Banking, interest, in, interestingly, is not just regulations for greater security, privacy, data portability, and interoperability for the UK's nine largest banks and building societies. It's also technical standards that involve OAuth and OpenID Connect. Um, so the way it works is you're basically doing a special purpose version of third-party permissions, the fourth kind of permissions we discovered. Um, and they've kind of used a special part of OpenID Connect to do this trick. So the way that it works is the third-party payment app that you're using as, as a merchant app wants to let you pay through your, your bank account. So that's the... That's the um, PISP there. So it collects what it calls consent details, and, and I want you to get hung up on the terminologies, of what you intend to purchase. Let's say it's a bicycle for a certain amount of money. It collects that information. It calls that consent. Let's, let's not worry about it too much. It bundles those details, sends them ahead to the bank before you've actually logged into the bank and receives an intent ID. And then it redirects you to the bank with that ID and enables you to log in, and then ultimately allows you to authorize, what it calls authorize, confirm those details. And then that transaction succeeds, assuming you have the money in your account to do it. So it kind of pushes ahead something before you've actually logged into your bank. And it sort of shows the green shoots of possibly being able to push ahead your preferences for what you'd like done with your data. It happens to push ahead some personal details of you, which UK Open Banking makes you do, but a generic solution in the direction of what we'd like to do maybe doesn't have to do. Um, so that's one green shoot. The second green shoot is user managed access, which is another standard that is also built on top of OAuth and OpenID Connect. Um, in full disclosure, I founded and still uh, chair the group that does uh, user managed access. Now, this is a type of peer to peer delegation where the, the kind of the OAuth resource owner role shares with an entirely other party. Um, it's, and it um, loosely couples the AS and the RS of OAuth. 
And it enables a simple dashboard that you could manage who you shared with in sort of GDOC-like fashion. So it's applicable to financial services, it's applicable to healthcare, it's applicable to um, Internet of Things. I'd like to give you a, a real life uh, healthcare example that you know I'm, I'm working with uh, somebody on. So let's say Alice uses a health insurer as a sharing hub for three entirely different data sources that may not even come from the health insurer. Um, that sharing hub would be the authorization server. Bob currently has no relationship with Alice, but they get married. Alice would like to share a subset of that data with Bob due to their relationship. Maybe uh, the information about what prescriptions she gets and her fitness wearable data, but not uh, information about her benefit claims. Bob tries to access, let's say, her fitness wearable data that the health insurer has agreed to be the sharing hub for, even though it doesn't actually see any of that data. The sharing hub therefore allows the data access request on the basis of the fact that he's married to her. So that access attempt actually goes through. This is through basically OAuth access token access. Now, sadly, Alice divorces Bob, which in US health insurance terms is a qualifying life event. So she can do it anytime and that um, should be able to go through and, and happen at any time. And now the sharing hub needs to be able to end all relationship-based sharing with Bob. And it needs to be able to prove that both to Alice who has an interest in needing to see this and to any auditors. So what does all this mean now? If these are sort of two green shoots about how we could meet these me to be criteria and life cycle management um, for both people and organizations, given that Consent does not maybe have an endless future. What could you do about democratizing data control now? We've kind of got this pyramid of where privacy has been going. We kind of have this data protection and data privacy 1.0 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that looked like security of, of um, personal data where, data, where data subjects were kind of disempowered. Um, and then slowly, the regulations have been adding more and more power for data subjects, such that there were, um, organizations were required to give more data transparency. Oh, yes, we hold this about you. Oh, yes, we, we um, are, are going to hold, uh, ask for this about you because we're going to do this with the data about you. And they've been sort of, the regulations have been saying, well, you have to give a little bit more data control to data subjects. But data subject is even not a very empowering term we're gonna to have to start recognizing that people need more data control and deserve more data control and consent is working so badly that it may just fall over of its own weight. So start recognizing that if you're working inside an organization that is trying to implement this stuff, you do want a single view of the customer. You need to understand the kind of relationship that they want with you. First of all, they do want a single view of you and not you've got five domains and they deal with five domains. And they do want a relationship with you that they can start when they want and potentially end when they want, not just because the regulations say so. Secondly, you want to be able to offer a really inclusive permission management dashboard across all of the apps and channels that you offer to them, not just a consent management dashboard. This is something that we actually do. It's not just consent management. It's not just marketing preferences. It may also be delegation to other people, delegation to other parties. This is getting very popular in healthcare at the moment. Um, and then for people that you already recognize because they've engaged with you before, you really want to build express lanes that are absolutely secure, and this is possible today, uh, express lanes for how they get access to their stuff and engage with that stuff. And maybe they will share more with you on the basis of trusting you with it. So I'll conclude my remarks now and see if you have any questions for me. Let's take a look. 
Thanks, Eve. Yeah, um, I don't see too many questions. Maybe there's one here related to the financial data exchange and, and maybe give some, some commentary on what they're doing with consent. Yeah, so I am aware. We, I actually have a colleague who um, sits in the financial data exchange and um, I know there's, there's a lot of work to do in the financial data exchange, but I know that they're inspired by UK open banking. Um, we, I also have some colleagues who are working in Australia with the consumer data right. And UK open banking has actually inspired a lot of those efforts in the same way that GDPR has actually inspired a lot of efforts. And I think that's actually good because there's kind of like, there's the semantic APIs, if you will, right? So that's like the read write APIs that are, that have to be jurisdiction specific a lot of the time. And then I'm hoping that we'll kind of have the security privacy identity stack that accompanies them that should start to look a lot more of the same, hopefully, um, because that will enable as much interoperability as possible. Because, you know, in financial services, you have a lot of cross-border data flows that you have to achieve. Um, and the more that consent can be, I'm not going to say implicit, I'm going to say abstract so that people can start to abstract what they've consented to so that it's more convenient. Um, I, I think that would be a good thing. Um, so yes, uh, please feel free to reach out on XNLGRRL on, on Twitter uh, if you want to discuss more. Um, David? Yeah. Um, maybe like you mentioned that uh, the sort of regulation or perhaps um, at least informing some of the, the work in, this, in, in the standards domain. Do you think regulation is, is ahead here? Is that really the driving force? Um, how's, how's that, how do you see that playing yeah. out? I mean, the reality is regulation is, uh, it's never super innovative. It tends to be behind the curve, right? And companies will tend to do only as much as they need to. But I have talked to a number of companies that are, are really surprisingly innovative. So, you know, there's some folks in Singapore that I've talked to where there hasn't till really recently um, been, oh yeah, I, I am sharing my whole screen. Uh, maybe I will stop sharing my screen. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there, so folks in Singapore that I've talked to who are really innovative and who have been looking ahead to either a huge um, uh, a coming regulatory re regime or have wanted to um, be innovative around um, that, that data control equation, right? So something that uh, humanitarians have said for a long time, folks who are involved in UMA have said is um, it's well known that privacy is not encryption. <laughs> you know, that's, that can't be the be all and end all. Privacy is not secrecy, because if you don't share anything at all, well, you haven't accomplished anything, right? Um, so we like to say that privacy is context, control, choice, and respect, all four things together. So you can tell that that's, it's not entirely a technical equation. It is partly a relationship equation. It's partly relationship management. And so that's a tough thing for companies to do, um, but the best companies do it really well and they tend to win the day. So if you have a low privacy maturity, um, you, at the margin, you tend not to do as well. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, uh, thank you, Eve. I really appreciate you taking time. This has been fantastic. Um, definitely for the audience, if you have any other questions that spring to mind, reach out to Eve on, uh, on Twitter or, or anywhere else.